This is a production of Cornell University. Welcome to the Cornell University Lichen Collection at the Cornell Plant Pathology Herbarium. My name is Robert Derrick. I'm the curator of lichen since 1990 here and have much enjoyed working with our specimens. Uh, actually, lichenology is a, is a complex subject and it's, uh, it's, it's somewhat of a rare attainment in, with people. Uh, many people know what lichens are, but knowing them in detail becomes very difficult. And uh, it's, a, it's actually a very difficult, lonely, and frustrating pursuit sometimes in isolation. And uh, after, after a while, it becomes necessary to have an, uh, have an interaction with a mentor of some kind. And that can be extremely exciting and, and catalytic and learning much more about them. And I was very lucky to, to have that happen after 20 years by myself with a little bit of help along the way. And there are also our regional uh, groups of people who are interested in lichens in North America. And the one in this region around Ithaca, New York, and in the Northeast is the Eastern Lichen Network, which is run through uh, the New York Botanical Garden in the Bronx in New York City. And I was fortunate to be able to attend many of the early meetings of that and uh, meet most of the lichenologists of the region. Um, so the specimen, the, the collection that we have here of lichens is old. A lot of it is quite old and, and, and quite valuable, actually. And it's mostly uh, local flora and North American material, otherwise some from Europe some from all over different places in the world, but it particularly emphasizes the Northeast and New York. Um, and we have about 15,000 specimens in the collection. Uh, and it's been a joy to go through them all. We have many of them databased and they're just starting to uh, uh, wind, up, wind up that effort. With, and then after that, we'll be able to do more work with the actual specimens. We also rehoused re all of the specimens. Some of them were in the original wrappings from the 1800s and early 1900s, and were not, they were not in archival paper wrappings. Uh, the huge lichen collections in the United States are at New York Botanical Garden in the Bronx, at the United States National Museum in Washington, D.C., uh, Duke University has a huge cryptogam collection. Cryptogams are, include lichens. They're, they're beings that, have, uh, that produce spores as opposed to seeds, including fungi and algae. Uh, also, Michigan State University in East Lansing and, and the University of Ann Arbor as well both have large lichen collections and have a history of people who worked on them. Madison, Wisconsin is another place, Yale University is another, Corvallis in Oregon in the West. Uh, and, and these herbaria can have 200, 300,000 sometimes, so that gives some kind of idea of the possibilities. There aren't that many uh, lichens. I forget offhand exactly how many, but it's something like uh, 16,050, 500, I mean, something like that that have been described. There's probably many, many more because of uh, work in the tropics and people are constantly finding new, uh, new species and describing them in the literature. Uh, so a few quick words about the origin of our, our fungus herbarium here where the lichens are and also the Cornell University herbaria to provide perspective on this. Uh, uh, the Cornell plant pathology herbarium which is nicknamed CUP um, in the, in the uh, symbols of various herbaria uh, on a worldwide basis, was founded in 2007 by H.H. H. Wetzel, who was uh, an early mycologist. And he, uh, he donated his own herbarium of 5,000 specimens to uh, to the, plant, the new plant pathology department that he had founded and, and, and which he chaired. 
under the, the deanship of Liberty Hyde Bailey in the College of Agriculture at Cornell. And in the meantime, uh, specimens of uh, fungi and plant disease specimens were, were uh, accumulated and kept in, in, in this institution and lichens also along the way, although they weren't an emphasis early and I suppose pretty rarely are anyway. Um, uh, the, the Cornell herbarium actually got started in the 1860s in the arts college here, and there was no College of Agriculture at the time that came about, 19, about 1900, a little later perhaps. And so uh, lichens and fungi and, and mosses and plants and algae mushrooms, etc., were in the in the arts collection and these things other than that, and plus of course real plants, vascular plants, and all of them were called plants at that time even. Uh, in the meantime we've refined understanding of that. So I already mentioned that uh, another herbarium in ag, the ag school uh, happened in 1907 when uh, Herbert Heiss Wetzel founded this one. In 1913, another one was founded in the Ag School for Vascular Plants, and that was at the suggestion of Liberty Hyde Bailey again, and his student, a former PhD student, uh, uh, Carl McKay Regand, came back from uh, his teaching job at Wellesley College to be the curator and press professor and chair of the new botany department there, and in the meantime, uh, a lot of the the botanical efforts in the art school had been uh, dwindling a little bit as professors passed away or, or as uh, the new the newer barium and, and department and the ag school were becoming established and uh, it sort of just took off in a major way and and was very very well respected over decades. And it, it continued until uh, 1977, and Wiegand himself died in 1942, and then one of his students named Robert Clausen took over as the curator of the museum. Um, so uh, that's three separate institutions. The fourth one was donated to uh, Cornell in 1935 by Liberty Hyde Bailey, former dean of the College of Agriculture, who was retired, and his daughter, Ethel Zoe Bailey, who worked with him uh, for many years. And that one is the Liberty Hyde Bailey Oratorium. Uh, in this day, the word oratorium was coined by Bailey to describe a place for uh, the, uh, the study of, or, uh, cultivated plants and and their naming and, and uh, appearance in the literature and so forth. And it's a huge archive of cultivated plants, mostly in North America, but also from throughout the world. And uh, that continued from 1935 to the present. And in 1931, uh, the Arts Herbarium was uh, disbanded and distributed to the the different parts of it that were appropriate were distributed to uh, the plant path herbarium and the, the Wiegand herbarium. Um, I want to talk for a few minutes about George Atkinson who was who was an early uh, undergrad here. He finished the last two years of his undergraduate life uh, at Cornell, having started in uh, in a university in Michigan, he was from Michigan, and uh, he he wrote to the people at Cornell when he was a, a sophomore and at, at a small college in Michigan, and asked about getting into the program here, and they it sounded good to them, so they had him come, and in two years he had had his. Uh, his, um, his uh, Bachelor's of Philosophy, which is on his diploma, Baccalaureate in Philosophia in Latin. The whole diploma was in Latin. Anyway, he, uh, he was a very 
fine botanist by that time and ended up being hired at the University of North Carolina for a couple of years as a professor. After that, for another year in the University of South Carolina, and then went to uh, uh, Alabama. I forget the name. Anyway, he was at in in a in an economic uh, department in in plant pathology and uh, in agriculture and. Alabama until he was asked to come back here as a professor in 1892 when William R. Dudley, who had been an instructor and professor here, uh, left Cornell and went to uh, work with his friend uh, uh, David Starr Jordan, who was the new president of Stanford University and, and Atkinson. Uh, uh, Dudley went there to visit his, uh, or to to sponsor the botany department and, and get it going. And, and Atkinson was very, very prolific. He, he was uh, specializing at Cornell and here in, uh, uh, in mushrooms mostly. But one of the things he instituted right away was with his graduate students, including Wiegand, were uh, collecting local cryptogams because he was the new cryptogamic professor. And so they started collecting lichens around Difficult and we have, that's the core of the beginning of our collection. Lots and lots of specimens, hundreds of them. And uh, uh, one of the, the things that they did, he and Wigand went to uh, uh, Lake Placid in the Adirondacks, New York, and they collected when it was much more pristine than it is today. And, they, uh, in processing the specimens in the last couple of years, we realized that we had two state records in there. One of them was, uh, 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 what do you call it, a, a lungwort that was unusual, and uh, the other one was an usnea moss, an old man's beard type of thing. So that was very exciting to find them. Um, uh, in, in the 19-teens, he, he, be, he, was, he continued as a professor, and it, he was also the administrator later of Botany in the art school, or art school, sorry. But he, um, um, he changed, it, they changed his job to be a research professor so that he could work on a monograph on mushrooms of uh, the United States. I, North America, North of Mexico, probably, and he got going with this wonderful send-off trip and money from various sponsors to, to just study mushrooms for, uh, it was going to be several years, I believe, he, and we have at the herbarium here his outline of the books that he was going to do, I think there were going to be a dozen, ten or a dozen uh, uh, volumes of it. So he started the first year in Florida in the spring very early and followed the mushroom development all the way up to Washington, D.C. with three or four helpers who were hired through this donation of money. And then after that happened, he moved to the West Coast at the end of the summer and, uh, and ended up uh, in the Seattle area near Mount Rainier. And the, the student helpers, had to go back to school in October, and he was working on his own, and he, he was a very meticulous collector who had, uh, he, he, he kept very careful notes, he photographed the specimens, he pressed them, uh, and of course was out there collecting them. And so it was a, a, a huge effort, and he was doing this by himself in November, and was on Mount Rainier, and got, got, it was pouring rain, and he kept going, and, he, he became very ill, and uh, that was the year in 1918 that the Spanish flu was going around in the United States after World War I. And he, he caught it, and the woman who was taking care of him in the boarding house caught it also, and he, he died in the boarding house. So it was a horrible tragedy, but it, it, it's, it's really unfortunate that that happened. Anyway. He was an amazing person, and he, he had written a lot of textbooks, was also a wonderful uh, artist. So um, that's a little history here. 
Um, so I wanted to talk for a few minutes about uh, how one collects a lichen and processes it for, for a museum. Uh, they are very brittle often, and uh, uh, this is a twig that fell off a, uh, a balsam fir in a ravine near, near Ithaca a few years ago. It's covered with lichens, very, very pretty kind of thing. And uh, it's a, the, the lichen I'm interested in that's on here is called Avernia mesomorpha, the, the uh, boreal oak moss. And uh, the way that I have developed for collecting lichens is because they, they, have, they require a lot of detail on labels and documentation, they need to, uh, you need to keep them separate from, like you can't just go out with a plastic bag and just put lots of lichens in it and then sort them out when you get home because they get all mixed up. So what I did was use, uh, use a letter envelope and just put the lichen inside and write everything on the outside that needs to be written. And in this case, this is one from uh, the Adirondacks, it says, Avernia mesomorpha fertile, which means it has apophysia, which is rare in the species. From little, it's got a nice name, Little Cherry Patch Pond in the Adirondacks. It's near Lake Placid, and it was on a dead branch of uh, balsam fir, the same plant that it's on here from the Finger Lakes, on the 4th of June in 1997. So to put this into an herbarium, you need to put, we, we developed a, uh, uh, our own packet here, which was, uh, it, I, I developed this years ago for ease rather than having special paper having to be cut to size. This is just a regular eight and a half by 11 inch sheet of paper. And this is a, three, a four by six inch card that are used for file. They used to be used before we stopped using paper. He says with a smile. <laughs> um, uh, we, we still use them in a barrier. So I was folding, uh, to make the, an envelope to put the, the specimen and I was folding them, folding the letter paper around the card which makes the, the sides then fold back and hold it. When, and these are, these are stored here vertically in drawers. So that's why I was doing it this way. And it's just exactly the right size, it's very easy to use, and you can get archival cards or you can cut up a herbarium sheet that's used for mounting plants as, as into four by six pieces for the inside. And then uh, nowadays, in the past, people wrote uh, labels on, in ink usually uh, on, on uh, various sorts of paper. And in this day and age, we usually do it on a computer, and so you can you can uh, format it to fit on the outside of a packet of that size. And this is the packet from the Adirondacks uh, specimen that I just was talking about. Uh, it had. I, let me read the data so you understand, so you get an idea of the kinds of things that are put on these. It's basically the who, what, when, where, and why of the collection. Uh, where is Adirondack Mountain, Mountains Flora? It's my herbarium number L7526. The, the identification is Avernia mesomorpha Nile. It's called boreal oak moss. It's in the Parmelia, Parmeliaceae family. Uh, the, the place is, it's like an address. It tells you how to get there. New York, Essex County, town of North Elba, the northwest side of Route 86, about two miles northeast of Lake Placid, a boggy fringe of little cherry patch pond on dead leaf on dead branches of balsam fir, Abies balsamia, exceptionally luxuriant with the rare apothecia, and is collected 4th of June in 1997 by me, determined the same day by the collector. So that that's a nice catalog in a succinct way about about the information. And nowadays also people like to put on this is quite a while ago now. Nowadays, they like the latitude and longitude because it helps with computer systems and so forth. And, and so the label gets glued on the outside of the packet, and then the packet opens, 
and inside is the card. And we have these little, because lichens are very brittle when they're dry, uh, I usually have an inner envelope like this that could be folded uh, so that uh, it doesn't slide around. So I'm going to put this in here. Like that. And then it folds up and goes back in here. And uh, the flaps are folded down and it's, it's done and ready to go. And the last step nowadays is uh, putting it into a, uh, a national database of specimens called the Viking Portal, which is sponsored by a consortium of Herbaria. Uh, and it basically involves taking all the information on the label and just putting it into boxes on the screen and then being it goes into the database. It's, it's very time consuming and, and fussy, but it's, it's worthwhile to do and it's, uh, it's satisfying to get done. So that's a little bit about specimens and collecting. I usually carry a, a, plastic, a plastic bag with handles like from stores, which you don't get nowadays very often. And, uh, and just put the envelopes in, or you can do it in a filled sack or a big pocket if you have a, a roomy pocketed uh, jacket. Uh, now in the collection itself, uh, let me get up for a second here open the door. Um, this is the way we, are st we store them here. They, they're, there are two series basically here. One is uh, a local collection from the Finger Lakes region of New York and the other one is a general collection. And because we have material from all over the world, uh, there is a, a key here. We use color code coded dots on the corner of the packet to show where it comes from. And if you see a blue dot there, it means it's from New York State, for example. If it's green, it's from New England. Uh, if there isn't any, it's from the rest of the United States and Canada. And gray is South America. Flesh colored is Antarctica. Yellow is Europe. Brown is Africa. Orange is Asia and purple is Australia and the Pacific Islands around it. So it, you can just instantly tell where it's from when you see the color of the dot once you understand the system. And it also parallels the same uh, color coding that they have for ge geographical reference in the Bailey Oratory and Barry and Cornell where all the vascular plants now are. So it's within our institution, our sister Barry, and we are agreeing on the geographic stuff. Now, um, this is this is how they're arranged. We have these these metal drawers, and they have uh, the specimens in there are vertically arranged. And then there's a card that has the name of the can see okay, um, has the card. Um, showing the name, the Latin name of the lichen, and everything in their barium is arranged alphabetically by genus, and then under the genera by the, the name, the species name. So it's easy to find. This one is uh, Loberia pulmonaria, which is the lungwort lichen. This isn't the right one. Uh, this is a common one. Some places in the north, it's, it's pretty common. It's a rare thing at this latitude. It's a boreal uh, lichen. It's one of the, it is the largest, most spectacular in North America. I've got a better uh, example I'll show you in a minute. But this is uh, a big, husky kind of folios lichen. And you can see on the upper corner here the barcode. Let me see if I can put my fingers in. This is dried as it came off the tree, and it's and when they're fresh outdoors, they're bright green if they're wet. And this is just dried, and the underside is mottled like this. This is called lungwort because 
in the, in the old days, far along, far back in the old days of Europe, they called um, they followed a doctrine of signatures where they uh, used things in nature that resembled organs in the body to treat diseases in the body. So this was used that way. I don't, I don't know about its efficacy. So this, this cabinet all the way around to here is a general collection and then the, the Hugo Basin is in the bottom of this and this whole, whole uh, column here. And this one has just been organized last week finally after getting the last things mounted in, 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 in the database. So now we can start working with them. Once they're in the collection and organized, it, it, it just is easy to work with them. It's, it, that's when the fun really happens. Now mine, uh, I have my own herbarium here too, which is right behind me. And this is, uh, I've worked on this from 1974 until the present, although I haven't collected much recently. And uh, I have mostly uh, worked in specific areas in New York and elsewhere in the Northeast to collect, and it's mostly been doing floristics, which means to going out and looking, examining the flora and, and collecting specimens to document it. So my, my home is in the Catskill Mountains, about 100 miles southeast of here and uh, near the Delaware River, and so I did a lot of collecting there. Also the Shanga Mountains, which are just east of the Catskills on the west side of the Hudson, and then Cuga Lake Basin flora around Ithaca a little bit. And it, um, unfortunately, there aren't a lot of really good lichen habitats here, but uh, wetlands are particularly good, but some of them are a bit depauperate. It may have something to do with the concentration of vehicles in the airport around Ithaca. The same happens in Albany. Um, then Adirondacks I've done a little collecting in, and uh, Long Island and different parts of New England. And uh, another concentration was the Albany area on the sand plains and the, and the pine barrens there, which haven't been very well documented. So it's been delightful to do that, and I've been able to do uh, I have about 4,000 packets, so it's a huge, rather large collection. It sort of amazes me I was able to collect that many sometimes. Um, so let's see. I wanted to talk about uh, growth forms of lichens. This is and about identifying them. Uh, this display is... Uh, shows different growth, growth, the different growth forms. Uh, the commonest and easiest ones are folio species, which look, are called leafy lichens, and uh, fruticose ones, which are called, uh, they're like shrubby, shrubby growths. They're, that's, fruticose means shrub, like shrubs. Then there's a whole uh, universe of crusts crustose lichens, which are just exactly what it sounds like. They form a crust over the soil or on bark or on rocks. And then there's a tiny little one that I'll talk a little more about soon called uh, uh, squamulose lichens. They're little flaky pieces of foliose-type thallus uh, that are on wood or uh, rock usually. And then the final one is umbilicate. It's a, it's a strange kind of word, but it, when I explain, I think you'll understand. They're, they're big, many of them are big sheets like this uh, that grow on rocks, and they are, they're called rock tripes. And they have one point of attachment where this yellow arrow is on the rock, and then this big flabby thallus just hangs there. This is the underside, which is black, and this is the upper side on top, which is brownish usually. A little bit green when they're, when they're, uh, they're fresh. And this, uh, 
This covers, it like mantles outcrops of rock, particularly acid rocks like sandstone or quartzite or, uh, or granite. And they're, uh, they're in, in pristine places that, that still exist, they can be absolutely outrageous the way they, uh, they cover rocks and most impressive. Anyway, that's a, that's an umbilicate lichen. So these five uh, units of, of types of lichens are used in keys, and they they also uh, are often arranged by color in keys. And lichen colors are pretty subtle. They're 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 bluish gray or greenish gray or brown or uh, dark brown. Some of them. But there are some that are more colorful. This this collection here is a uh, is uh, yellow green lichens of the yellowish green lichens of the Finger Lakes, and this one in the upper corner here is the is the uh, uh, the boreal oak moss that I just showed you with the packet in a little bit more well developed uh, way. This is a folios one called. Uh, Flavopunctilia caparata, and this one is Flavopunctilia, okay, sorry, I'm in trouble, Flaventior. This one is uh, Flavopunctilia ceridica, which is just showing up recently in Ithaca in the last few years. This one is a bright orange, yellow orange one called Allocetraria oxiana. I think it's actually in Osnal Cetraria now. And this is a tiny little one called Parmeliopsis capitata. So these are mostly wetland things. The, the big one here isn't. And there's a fresher uh, specimen here. This is from the Catskills a couple of years ago. It shows a beautiful bright green color when you see it. It's an absolutely gorgeous thing on tree trunks or rocks. Or mostly tree trunks, they're black underneath. So in keys to, to lichens, it will say, you know, it'll ask you what the color is. You can see it helps to. Um, yellow ones is another subset. There aren't very many, but they're very bright and fun to find outdoors. This one is in bogs on twigs. It just boings right out. It's I have to turn this. this pine lichen or powdered sunshine, Volpicia, Volpicia pinastri. And this one is uh, the candle flame lichen, or lemon lichen, Candelaria concolor, which is actually a tiny little folio one that looks like a crust. This is a crust called common gold speck lichen, which is on rock always. But these, these bright yellow ones aren't very common. They're also there's also a suite of a few that are uh, brilliant orange. Are called Xanthoria or Xandolidosa now. And on the top is a, a red one and a pink one too that are very, these aren't very common. I mean, the, the, the colors aren't very common in, in our lichens around here. And the red one here is the British soldiers or red crest lichen with, and the red color on the top of the branches are actually the epithecia of the fungal partner. And the color comes from the sterile tissues in among the, where the spores are. And uh, the pink one is pink earth lichen, which has a clay-like, a grayish blue colored crust on the ground, and then these little things that look like mushrooms come up, actually, but they're not, because it's not out of the city of my seed, it's in Ascomycete. And by the way, most lichens are Ascomycete. It's about 98, 8 or 99 percent are uh, uh, the fungal partner. I'll get to the, that in a minute, too. But the fungal partner is, is usually an Ascomycete, and there are just a handful of them that are the city of my seeds. Now, there's another group here. These are uh, bluish gray lichens of various colors. This is more typical of lichen colors. They're very subtle and the best way to, under, to understand this is to uh, go, out on a, a, go out on a bright day and you won't see lichens very well because everything is so dazzled by sunlight and other pretty things in the, in the world. 
But these are uh, these blowing right up into 3D. If it's if it's a wet, drippy day and it's cloudy, you see the colors much better on days like that. It's also much easier to uh, to collect them because they're very brittle and can break otherwise. And here are a few crusts that are rather more colorful. There's, a, there's an orange one there. Bright chartreuse. So let me talk for a second about uh, the definition of a lichen. Uh, this is a new book called Urban Lichens, uh, A Field Guide to North, for Northeastern North America by Jessica L. Allen and James C. Lindemar. It came out last year. And the region covered is, now remember urban, New York City, Chicago, Toronto, Boston, New Haven, Philadelphia, Baltimore, and Washington, D.C. And uh, these people have gone, gone through most of their base. Lendemer is based in New York City, and Allen is now in uh, what is it? Uh, Eastern Washington University. But she did her PhD with Lendemer and Richard Harris, who was the mentor for Lendemer as well, who passed away less a year ago, last spring. And uh, so they're both interested in the lichens in New York City, and there's a, I think it was 250 species they found in the city. And one of the things that they did was uh, uh, they sponsored bio blitzes in all the parks in New York, and they had all these people coming out and look, you know, all these eyes. And then they could find, they, they collected specimens and photographed them, the specimens to identify them with, because some of the crusts need to have, uh, uh, they need to have chemistry examined in various ways. The easiest way is by spot tests, which is to take, like if you have a folio species, if you, if you, uh, if you pare away the, the fungal uh, crust on the top of the lichen, you'll expose the medulla, which has, it's often white, and it has much looser hyphae in it, whereas the top of the cortex, the upper layer is, uh, is solid. Uh, fungal uh, tissue threads. So if you get into the medulla, which is where the chemistry happens, uh, because that's where the, the algae are, uh, you, you can use several reagents. One of them is just Clorox or other bleach. And if you touch certain ones of these uh, with Clorox, it turns bright pink or it will turn orange or yellow. And other the same with uh, past, uh, KOH, and there's a third one that's commonly used, which is called paraphenylene diamine, and that it's it's a nasty thing. It's, it stains things, and it's it's dangerous actually. You have to be really careful with it, but it's very helpful in diagnosing things. And what these color changes mean is that there's a certain chemical that's produced. Then lichens produce unique chemicals in their in their physiology, and uh, they they. Uh, uh, they react in specific ways in, with these colors. So if, uh, if, it's, uh, if it changes color, it, it indicates the presence of a certain, like an acid, they're often acids, the compounds that they, they produce. And uh, you can't tell looking at them, you have to do these. And then a more uh, involved chemistry operation is for often with crust, but also sometimes with uh, the macro lichens, the fruticose and, and the folios ones, is thin layer chromatography where you extract uh, extract uh, chemicals into, I forget what it is, it's been years since I did it. I hardly ever did it anyway, but they, it extracts stuff out of the thallus and is put into a, a cylinder with a volatile thing that separates everything out and they have a paper where uh, a line goes up from the, the, you put a dot of the fluid on the bottom and it separates out up into boom, 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 boom. And they often run a, uh, a control for something that only has a certain chemical and you can just look across from the control and see uh, if it's in a, any of the, they usually do 20 at once or something like that. So it's a very complicated thing and it requires a, a mentor and years of Years of fiddling with it, it's very slow, but it gives you the definitive 
uh, the, the definitive answer about about identifications often. It's sometimes very difficult to deal with. They're, they are easy to identify sometimes. The big, quote unquote, big pretties, you know, the, the large macro lichens, some of them are very obvious, like Longmore, for example, or British soldiers, but they're not, uh, not so easy sometimes. Just while I've got this here looking, this, these are some 3D fruticose lichens that look like uh, little shrubs. They have these little upright uh, pieces that that branch. This is another one. I forget what this is. These were from Maine along the roadside. I just grabbed them. I had round containers that I put them in. So, <laughs> but they're, I use these for showing people what they are in labs and stuff. Now, let's see. Um, I wanted to talk about some books. Um, oh, I didn't read the definition, did I? Sorry, got sidetracked. Uh, talking about New York City lichens, identifying them. So this is uh, the intro their introduction, the first paragraph. Now, most people know that lichens have a fungal partner and an alga partner, and that they, they live together and are mutually beneficial to one another. This crystallizes it in a way that goes a little beyond the usual understanding. And remember, this is uh, 2021. Lichens are some of the most fascinating and widespread life forms on the planet. Their fundamental makeup alone inspires the imagination, as they are not one single organism, but at least two. Notice at least. Uh, the majority of a lichen is an intensive cooperation between a fungus and an alga or a cyanobacterium. And cyanobacteria used to be called blue-green algae. It's separate now. Um, uh, and sometimes they have three, three symbionts or participants in this interaction as required to form a lichen. The fungus forms most of the structure uh, and the alga lives inside the structure where it photosynthesizes and provides sugars to the fungus in return for a protected space to live. Uh, however, that is, this is the interesting part to me. I mean, that's all wonderful and magical that these little things can live together, but uh, that is just the beginning when it comes to the uniqueness of a lichen in, on, and throughout the scaffold of the main fungus and alga lives an unfathomably complex and diverse community of bacteria, non-lichenized fungi, microscopic worms, and water bears. In many ways, lichens are miniature universes better thought of as tiny ecosystems rather than strict symbioses between a single fungus and a single alga. So, very fascinating uh, beings, certainly. And in, in a folios lichen, uh, if this is the height of the lichen blown way, way, way up, you'll have a cortex often on the top, which is just hyphae. Then the medulla that I talked about, uh, looser hyphal strands, and then may or may not have a, a cortex on the bottom, and then there's some kind of old fast like rhizines or something that hold it onto the substrate on a rock, on a on a on a, a tree branch or a twig or something like that, and sometimes on the ground. But anyway, the in the case of green algae at least, uh, they are they're globose emerald green single cell uh, beings and they they can't survive direct sunlight for too long, and so this, this mesh of hyphae on the top of, in the cortex filters the sunlight. They need sunlight to photosynthesize, but they can't, it, it's bad for them to have it too bright, so that filters it for them. And so they're down in a, in a layer, like if this is the thing again, the cortex is here, cortex is here, medulla is here, they're down about, you know, fourth or fifth, maybe, a fourth of the way down, and there's a whole, if you do a cross section, there's a whole uh, uh, glittering little gallery of these wonderful little green things sitting there. It's amazing to see, and, and they, they arrange themselves in the landscape too, 
so that uh, they're on a certain side of a tree where they get enough sun but not too much or a rock or and some of them actually grow in dark places and glow like this one here that I showed you before the bright chartreuse greenish yellow one grows in uh, had it upside down sir uh, it's Lake Norethysera I'm sorry Silalekia lucida which is uh, it's on and where I grew up, it was on the north side, at the base of the north side of stone walls in the shade. So, and this is like this beautiful bright yellow green color down in there. It's actually wonderful to see. One of my favorite things. And I should mention also that uh, uh, the, the scientific name of a lichen it has a genus and species, but it, because these other, these different species are living together, it becomes a strange kind of, <laughs> it, it goes beyond, uh, beyond the usual uh, name for a mammal or a bird or whatever, a plant. Uh, so in, in lichens, uh, the scientific name uh, refers to the mycobiont, the fungal partner, and uh, that's why they're in a fungus herbarium. And the uh, the other the other components of the symbiosis often uh, a green alga uh, have their own genus and some of these aren't known very well the, the algae they don't know species so it's hard to identify them because you have to get them in, in certain stages and stuff and perhaps being in the lichen distracts them from things that would happen if they were free living. Uh, so let's look at books for a minute here. This is, uh, this is the best book for identifying New York State lichens. It's called The Macro Lichens of New England, which means folios and friticose ones. I think squamulose ones are in here too. By James Hines and Patricia Hines, who are from Maine. And I knew them through uh, the Eastern Lichen Network. Uh, in the 90s when we were so excited and meeting one another and running around outdoors and looking for things. They're both very, very enthusiastic. And they actually met on a hiking. They were doing, they were uh, uh, trying to climb all the high peaks of Maine. And they kept running into one another and they became enchanted with the, not only with one another, but with, but with uh, uh, with the lichens that were all around the, the, the tops of the mountains. And, and they ended up writing this amazing book. It's, it's the, the perfect kind of guy. It's just arranged so beautifully. And, the, and uh, Patricia did the photographs. She used to work as a photographer and, and with SEM uh, images and so forth. And uh, they were helped a lot by Dick Harris and other people with this. But this is the definitive book. It has wonderful keys. It's amazing. And then where this uh, falls short, if that's the right way to put it, probably not. This enormous thing that weighs nine pounds, if not 20, is uh, Erwin Brodo's uh, book on lichens in North America. And it's illustrated by Sylvia and Stephen Sharnoff, the photographers, who did amazing work. And they, they went on expeditions all over. Uh, the country and in Can this country and in Canada and photograph them and this contains uh, the crusts also so it's a good place to look and in fact uh, in the Heinz's book uh, if they don't have a good picture themselves they refer to the pictures in in uh, Brodo and there is an update on the keys of these that he did in the meantime this was published the Bro uh, Brodo's book was published in 19. I'm sorry, 2002, I think. Tell you in a minute. And theirs in 2007. 2001, this one is. He comes to visit us once in a while. He did his master's here, and that was his introduction to lichenology, actually. He worked on, I think it was, uh, I can think of the name of the lake. It's, Oneida Lake, 
which is just north of Syracuse. On the south shore, there's a Cornell Biological Field Station. He, he did an ecological study, I think. And then he did his PhD on the lichens of Long Island, which was fascinating. It was a landmark publication when he did that. And he's, in the meantime, he's been uh, the lichen curator at Ottawa at the National Herbarium of Canada. He's a very, very eminent person. Uh, So I also wanted to mention this wonderful old classic. Classics are like timeless books that go on and on and on, and their influence is still there. And this is something that's largely forgotten, but it's a wonderful book called The Lichen Book, Handbook of the Lichens of Northeastern United States by George Guy G. Nearing. And it was uh, published by him in 1947. And he illustrated it himself with drawings on every page. And he gave common names to everything, including all the crusts, which is unheard of in the lichen book, pretty much. And this is the, sorry, I can't read it up This is the one. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, so they're very helpful. The, the, the things that the the keys that he used, however, dot dot dot, are <laughs> intensely <laughs> difficult to use because he has the characters all across the top, and then uh, he has th these. Numbers on the left refer to the different lichens in the group, and it's based on structures, but he's got pluses and minuses and all these continuum. There are too many continua for me to process. And one of the students who was working with me a couple of years ago said, Bob, we should just put this into a computer and it would work it all out for us. Anyway, there, I admire him for doing something original. It doesn't work very well for me, but it might have for him. And I just, I love this stuff. It's from 1947, and so the nomenclature, there's been a huge overturn in nomenclature in the last 30, 40 years in this, as, we, as the, the thin layer chromatographic techniques developed and, and were, were perfected. And, uh, and just people learning more and more about it. We had better photography. And, and, Drawings are good. They're very difficult to draw because they're so tiny and so intense in detail. And so you have to blow them way up in order to do it and then can only do a piece. So they're difficult to illustrate. But now with these wonderful books that have photographs of everything, they're, they're coming into their own finally. I wanted to talk to also for a couple of minutes about uh, uh, like just something interesting in like ecology and there's a lot of like logical ecological things that are wonderful but this is a this is one of them this is a I don't know if you can see it hold this behind it it's a ruby it's a nest of the ruby throated hummingbird and it's made of plant down that's held together with spider webs and caterpillar silk and, and the, it's built entirely by the female, usually on a, 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 a slanting twig like this. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it has a mosaic of lichens on the outside. And the bird hovers in front of a lichen, puts her bill on the grown tip, pulls it off, places it two or three hundred times. I counted the number on another nest a couple hundred or more. And you can just imagine the labor involved. It's, it's bird art, if you want to call it. That's an amazing thing to see. And I saw one nest one time that had the female on it. And the female herself builds the nest. She lays two beautiful, long, oval, pearly white eggs in the nest and uh, feeds the babies for two weeks, maybe three weeks. And they go zooming off. Anyway, it's wonderful to see this. Now, there, there are other birds in our fauna that have lichen uh, decorations on their nest. One is uh, the, the wood peewee, which has usually used, used this is uh, 
this is blue gray and green, yellow green. Uh, the wood peewee, off, the ones I've seen have always been bluish gray colored. And they're, it's a bigger nest that's settled, saddled on the upper branch that's horizontal. Uh, uh, blue gray gnat catcher is another one that has, uh, has ornamentation of lichens on the outside. And then there's the par Perula warbler, that, or northern Perula, I think they call it nowadays. That, that's a warbler. And it has, uh, it's about this long. And they have long festoons of uh, Usnea lichens, which I didn't show you, did I? No. Um, let me show you one right now. This is an Usnea. <laughs> it's, it's Usnea one, just enough from Washington. And uh, it, it can be 20, the threads can be 20 feet long in, in pristine situations in the Northwest. This is the one of the two that Atkinson found in the Adirondacks, actually. This isn't his, but I mean, this species is. Anyway, where these things grow in big festoons off trees, it doesn't have to be that one. Others, you know, are shorter. The Perula warbler weaves a nest in the hanging mantle of lichens like that, and they're, uh, they're probably quite well camouflaged. They're lovely, beautiful little birds. While I'm talking about this, now, let me show you this. Uh, this is a this is from uh, the Treman Gorge in I think of New York. It's a state park. And it was collected in 19, 1894 by uh, Carl McKay Gand, who was a student with uh, with Atkinson, who was collecting the. Uh, he was collecting uh, the lichens of the Ithaca area. And he was, he became one of the great taxonomists in the world with plants. And Doug, my, the, the, a man named Doug who works with me as a, as a volunteer dealing with the lichens, and I were just astounded when we went through uh, the, the local stuff to see how many of them were identified with by, by Gand in that era when he was a graduate student here. And the literature was not very good. You, know, you couldn't figure this stuff out very well. And he, I would say 90% of the time he had it right. He just may not have had, uh, uh, he may not have had the right genus name because they tend to change over decades. But, Otherwise, it was, it was very, very impressive. We're lucky to have this stuff. They, I'm so grateful to them for having uh, created things like that, uh, collections from those, those days. And I wanted to talk about two other things. Um, this is right here. Uh, one of the projects that I got into sort of sideways from something else was uh, collecting and studying uh, the oyster lichen. And it's, it's something that, uh, it's a squamulose species. I did a picture of it. Uh, it, it grows, it, the individual thalli are, they're, they're single little flakes that grow on dead wood usually and or on living wood and often it, the pH is four, very, very acidic they like. And uh, so that, that includes conifers, red maple, black cherry, uh, a number of other trees, but particularly conifers they like and maple. And they grow in, uh, in dappled shade because of the sun thing I was talking about before being too hot for them maybe sometimes and so they grow pretty I think uh, the squamules get to be a couple of centimeters or millimeters across this is like in this corner uh, they're they're grayish green uh, and they they mass on the tree and they have tiny propagules that are uh, called ceridia that are uh, they're, they originate in the medulla where the, the green algae are. And the bottom, I, somewhere I have a photograph of it. 
I, when I did this, a friend of mine did scanning electron micrographs for me. Of the Ceridius, it's really exciting to see. As you can see the little, you can see the little flakes here on the top, like the thing that looks like this, and then it's got eroding uh, little ball-like things at the bottom. That is uh, the Ceridia. And they're one twentieth of a millimeter in diameter, so you need. Okay. Um, so that's that's this, the the propagule that's used to for this to uh, uh, reproduce is a vegetative one, and it it it's the algal cells are a couple of three of them are four or five maybe are meshed with a few threads of the uh, of the fungus, so that the whole thing just goes off flying on the breeze or down the trunk in a trickle of water when it rains or caught on um, woodpecker feathers or beetle hair or something like that. They get dispersed around and wind also if it's hot. Anyway, it was fascinating to do experiments with these things and look for this thing. It, it had hardly been collected in North America. It was here, but not people were not noticing it or knowing it. And it looks like the base of a quidonia lichen, which has scramulous bases in these these uh, shrub-like things that come up out of them. So I think it was overlooked for a long time. But I just set out uh, to, to document where it was. And this is a, a map of New York here and then North America. And all the black dots are where I found, well, where I found it or where I saw specimens where it was from. And mostly in the Northeast, they're my dots. I mean, a study like this, one of the functions of an herbarium is to preserve the, the details of things like this. So these are the labels from various specimens from various places. I put them in on, on sheets by, uh, this, these are from Vermont, for example. And I just picked up. But this was a fun kind of project, and I was, I was doing inventories at the time in the Albany Pine Barrens and other vegetations of that type around Albany and Saratoga and Glens Falls, New York, where the big glacial lake was, where the Hudson came in into the Mohawk. And, uh, and, uh, and, and the Mohawk came into this huge lake, and it's laid down these huge sand plains all over the place. And that's where the Pine Barrens originated. So this is a, a, a an indicator species almost of pine barrens. It's very, very common on pitch pine, which is the dominant pine in these, these uh, savanna kind of habitats. I also was intrigued to find it in, in marshes and not marshes, but swamps and, uh, and other wetlands that had sort of dappled shade because of the water pools in between hummocks and things like that, which provided the humidity it needs and also uh, the dappled shade. And it's also an edge habitat thing, like the edges of forests, where there's enough, there has to be enough sun. On the, on the dunes at Albany, where it was blazing hot, there was, there was no humidity most of the time, unless it was raining. But you get down into the edges off the higher part of the dunes, where there were wetlands around, and it would be all over the pine trees. So it was interesting, very interesting study. I, don't, I think I looked at four or 500 specimens at the time. The other thing, one of the treasures in this place is what I'll, I'll stop with here. Uh, this is uh, this is this is called an exocotti. It's a uh, it's a collection. Uh, it's a Latin word that means a dried plant, literally. But it's a uh, in this particular sense, it's a uh, it's a scientific uh, paper, really, of by a specialist in some uh, uh, plant or fungal group, and uh, they issue uh, sets. They they write a paper that has is about a series of specimens that they're distributing to several places. They often 
they used to do, do them sometimes 30 or 40 different institutions or, or fewer. And this one, I don't remember how many, if I ever knew, but this is uh, one that I kept finding in our collection here when we were going through it. Um, we would find uh, pieces of paper this big that were archival with a label written in Latin, printed in Latin. And I, I didn't know who collected it. I knew it was some kind of set of things. So uh, this one is the same uh, as one that was in the gorge here, but this is from, if I can, uh, okay, it, the Latin label says, number 51, Usmia angulata, ac, which means it carries the person who identi or, uh, described it as new. Uh, Tuckerman synopsis, page eight, that's a reference to the literature. And it says, ad arbores, which means on trees, in Texas, leg, uh, in Texas, uh, legit is, is uh, legate, is the person who did the leg work. It's pronounced, or I mean, it's, uh, it's legulus is also is another way to do it. It usually has L-E-G period. Lindenheimer, which tells you the collector. So uh, there was, there were all of these different ones from all over the, just, they're, they're fascinating. These are from the 1860s and 50s and on. And, and these are so precious that I didn't glue them down even. I just put threads through them and hide it on the sheet. They're very old. I think we got these in something that Andrew Dixon White, the first Cornell president, uh, purchased in 1869. This is something, this looks like, let me see where it's from. In subalpinus montium alborum, which is the White Mountains of New Hampshire. And this is an Arctic thing. Look at these huge brown apothecia, the fungal partner. They're bright green when they're fresh. I've seen, we have specimens from Alaska also. So it's like one of those things where the little chunk of the Arctic sticks on the top of the highest mountains as a relic to the Pleistocene glaciers. Let's see if there's anything particularly spectacular. This is a reindeer like in here. That's one of the common ones. They're, they're gray, they're beautiful things. It's probably the better than Yep, and that's ad terum in Montebus, which means on the ground in mountains. Anyway, they're wonderful, and I put, I, I, I realized that we had here uh, the covers when these things came, they're printed covers that had lists of the specimens, and then it had a title page, it's called uh, Lichenes Americae Septentrionalis Exicati Fascicles 1 and 2, Carante, curator, the person who did it, Eduardo Tuckerman A.M., Academer Art and Sci. I can't read some of this stuff, uh, a fellow of the Royal Botanical Society in Edinburgh, and uh, I can't uh, read the rest. It says British Museum of Natural History, Cantagabrigii, Novae Anguli, <laughs> probably Cambridge. Uh, Typus Metcalf, oh, set by Metcalf and Company, Universitatis Typog of the University Typographer in 1847 is the date. So this is probably our oldest collection. And we had already or other people that are, we have a whole box in, you know, so. And with this, I didn't want some ugly looking uh, barcode on something that old, so I put the put them on the back. And this, this little label on the bottom is something I put on, which says, uh, like Henny's Americani, Septentrionale, Exicati, Chiranti, Eduardo, Tuckerman, Fascicles, blah, blah, blah. 
what I just read. It's also it's it'll, it's listed from 1847 to 54. Numbers 1 to 50 published in 1847. Numbers 51 to 150 in 1854. Sin on Tuckerman's printed label refers to the page number in his 93-page synopsis of Lichens in New England and other northern states in British America, 1848. See also Proceedings of the American Academy of Sciences, 1847. So this is one of the few that ever ever puts an identifying number to. I don't think it's very common that people do that. So that's one of the great treasures of this place. One more thing I wanted to mention under just some uses of lichens, if that's the word. Um, I've just gathered a few pictures over the years. This is a, a flower arrangement that has a Vedina stellaris in among the things at the base. It's a, it's a, it looks like a coral. It's, it's green. They're gorgeous. They're all, it's a boreal lichen. It's a reindeer lichen. Now this is out of National Geographic magazine. <laughs> it's um, Austria, it says, every five years the men of Telfs collect lichens to create wilder man, M-A-N-N, -N, or wild man, in English, costumes for the town's carnival festival. Tradition di dictates that they nibble on a piece of this lichen before the festivities. I think it would knock them out, it's so acidic. They're very bitter. Things. So that, that's another one. This is an advertisement for, uh, this must have been in it's a People magazine, I think. It says, want to tap into nature's moisture. It's for a moisturizer, and it's got a lichen in it as an indicator of that freshness. And then this is a, a door wreath for autumn that has a, it's got parmelias in it. I think it's a, fo a folios lichen. In the, in the thing. So this is, it's interesting to see these things. You see them once in a while. You don't see them very often in common culture. So I think wind, I wind up with this and thank you very much for your interest in our museum. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.